Hello, everybody. I'd like to welcome everybody uh, this evening on behalf of the Lake County Division of Transportation to the Darrell Road Phase One Engineering Study, the final public information meeting um, tonight. And you know, normally we would uh, be meeting in person, whether it, um, in the past has been at the Wakanda Township or at Island Lake Village Hall, but obviously circumstances these days dictate uh, another type of format here. So we're doing our meeting virtually and um, we're excited to bring you the final public information meeting. Uh, this project's been going on for a little bit now and I'm um, excited, excited to, um, with our consultant unroll, unveil the um, preferred alternatives and take any uh, questions and answers um, at, the, at the end of our session. We have a short little presentation um, that our consultant Civil Tech is going to roll into. And so with that, I will turn it on over to them to begin. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Matt. Uh, I am Joel Christel. I'm with Civil Tech Engineering. I'll be the project manager. Um, some of the other people we have um, with us today is Kevin Carrier from Lake County DOT, the Director of Planning and Programming. We have Mike Burke. For, he's the project engineer. Um, he is going to be uh, He's in the design department. And then I'll let uh, other staff from uh, Civil Tech and MSA Professional Services introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Jim Tibble with Civil Tech. I am the project engineer. Also working behind the scenes tonight is Tom McGillicuddy and Jen Hurtado. And I'm Ben Wilkinson with MSA Professional Services and I assisted the team with the design of the roundabouts for the project. Okay, uh, just a, a few housekeeping -ish things we wanna go forward with uh, before we start into the, the good stuff. Um, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen uh, to ask any questions. Uh, you can ask questions at any time during the presentation. However, the Q&A session will occur at the end of the presentation. Uh, questions not addressed will be posted to the project website or we can follow up at a later time. Um, if you lose internet or you're having a hard time with your connection, there is a call-in option available that's on the screen right now. Um, the number is 312-626. 6799 and then there's a webinar ID and a passcode uh, to make sure that you can get in. Um, we'll leave that up here for a few seconds to make sure um, and, you know you can write that down in case something does happen. Uh, the webinar however is being recorded uh, will be posted to the project website uh, for those that want to go back to it or for others that could not attend the meeting tonight. Next slide please. So what we're gonna discuss and cover tonight is uh, the following. We're gonna review the project purpose and need. We're gonna discuss the crash analysis and non-motorized travel. We'll discuss project developments that have occurred over the last couple of years since PIM number three. We'll present the preferred alternative as well as the benefits of the preferred alternative and then discuss the next steps. So the project purpose and need, what that does is it defines what can be considered reasonable, prudent, and practicable uh, alternatives. Uh, for this project, we considered alternatives which meet the purpose and need, and then look at other factors such as uh, design, uh, environmental, and then we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later uh, in the presentation. So the project purpose and need, which if you've, others that have attended and been involved in the project, uh, this has not changed. Uh, it is to address existing safety and operational improvement needs along Darrell Road. It's also to identify long range travel demand and transportation system improvement needs and to develop a staged transportation improvement plan. So one of the ways that we determine the existing safety in the corridor is to perform a crash analysis. We request crash data from various sources and map out the type, location, time of day, uh, pavement condition, uh, as well as severity of the crash. From these analysis, we can determine uh, if there's any predominant crash types uh, or patterns, and then look and see how we can improve safety within the corridor. Um, we have updated this uh, crash data exhibit from past ones. Um, we are now looking at the years 2014 to 2018. Uh, that is the latest data that we have. Um, so nothing really has changed as far as patterns. Um, over 50% of the crashes in the corridor were rear end and uh, right angle collisions. 
Um, many of those and most of those actually are uh, were due to speed along the roadway, poor sight distance, and geometric deficiencies. So as part of all Lake County projects, we, we must consider looking at all modes of transportation. Um, Lake County has developed our 2040 non-motorized plan, uh, and that plan is to improve the viability of travel without the need for an automobile. So this map shows an excerpt from that plan uh, that's within our project limits. Uh, bicycle accommodations are planned along Darrell Road as part of the plan um, and ultimately connecting to the Seen Hills Forest Reserve, which is kind of in the middle of that exhibit. Um, the Greenways and Trails plan um, shows the future Grand Illinois Trail coming from the west from McHenry County and then also would link to the Singing Hills Forest Preserve. So that would go um, through, uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about where that connection may go. Uh, we have been coordinating with uh, the Illinois Department of Natural Resources regarding uh, the location and timing of the implementation of the Grand Illinois Trail. So we needed to consider, and it's very important to consider uh, these plans as we went, moved forward with the project. So after the last public meeting, um, we submitted the environmental survey request. Uh, we call it an ESR for short, uh, which starts the environmental coordination. Uh, this includes historic uh, and archeological properties, uh, wetlands, threatened and endangered species, special waste and other factors. Uh, since that time, we have received all the clearances necessary to move forward with the project. Also as part of the process, uh, kind of the environmental part, um, the Illinois Historic Preservation Agency found two properties that warranted National Register of Historic Places consideration. So this was, what, what did that change? Well, that changed our design a little bit. This, it resulted in refinements in the design to avoid impacts to the historic resources. And what we did was we moved the shared use path that was on the west side, we re relocated it to the east side, and then the roundabout um, at Case Neville, um, was shifted northeast. So that was a few things that, that happened in, in the last uh, couple of years. Um, the next thing is that we, we've done some utility coordination. Um, this led to profile, uh, rotary profile adjustments to avoid pipeline impacts, um, kind of around the Dowell Road uh, uh, roundabout. And then we presented the preferred alternative to the stakeholders. With that, I will turn it over to Jim Tibble to discuss and unveil the preferred alternative. Thanks, Joel. So as we start planning for our proposed improvements, we consider the average daily traffic for the existing conditions. And also we look at the projected traffic for the future, 2040, the year 2040 in this case. And under current conditions, Darrell Road sees approximately 5,000 to 11,200 vehicles per day. Those numbers are anticipated to grow to approximately 11,000 to 20,000 vehicles per day. We look at not only the volume of traffic along these segments, but also at each intersection and how they can handle the volume. If intersections operate well, additional travel lanes may not be needed. This is the proposed typical section for the segment of, of Darrell Road between the Case and Neville intersections and the Dowell Road intersections. Darrell Road will be resurfaced as well as have shoulder improvements to provide a four foot wide paved shoulder and a four foot wide aggregate shoulder. A shared use path will be constructed along the east side of the roadway within the existing right of way and a drainage swale will be located between the path and the roadway. Further north from Dowell Road to Fisher Road, this is what the roadway will look like. It will have 12 foot lanes with a four foot painted median. This segment of the roadway will be reconstructed due to realignment of Darrell Road. The shared use path is continued along the east side with the drainage swale uh, between the roadway and the path. Moving back south towards the Case and Neville Road, uh, back at PIM public information meeting number three, we presented several different alternatives. We looked at combining the Case Road and Neville Road intersections into one by realigning Case Road to the north or realigning Neville Road to the south. 
We compared both the roundabouts and traffic signals at both of the alignments. The traffic signals resulted in greater impacts and project costs. The roundabout along the north alignment minimized impacts and costs compared to the alignment to the south. The proposed improvement to realign Case Road to the north and intersect Darrell Road at Neville Road is, is with a single lane roundabout. By having a single lane roundabout and shifting the road shifting Case Road to the north, we are able to avoid impacts to the southwest corner property. The roundabout will have splitter islands and truck aprons and will accommodate all street legal vehicles. The shared use path will be constructed along the east side of Darrell Road going to the north. Further north at the Dowell Road intersection, we looked at three different alternatives for the intersection. A roundabout at the existing intersection location, a roundabout along a realigned Dowell Road, and a traffic signal along a realigned Dowell Road. As Joel mentioned before, we had some discussions and some coordination with the utility companies. And because of the utilities adjacent to the existing intersection, the roundabout along the existing alignment was eliminated. The traffic signal and the roundabout along the realigned roadway both require the acquisition of one residence. The signal and the roundabout both have pretty similar impacts and project costs. However, the roundabout has additional benefits for safety and it provides corridor consistency. <clears throat> the proposed improvement is to realign Dowell Road to intersect Darrell Road at a single lane roundabout. This intersection will be closer to 90 degrees. The path continues along the east side. The roundabout will have pedestrian crossings at all legs. Along the west side of the intersection, the Grand Illinois Trail is planned to come in along the ComEd right-of-way. That will connect and cross over Darrell Road at the, at the north leg and continue north on the east side of the roadway. At Fisher Road to the north, we also looked at three different alternatives. A traffic signal at the existing intersection location, a roundabout at the existing intersection location, and a roundabout shifted to the south and east to avoid impacts. The traffic signal had greater project costs and the roundabout at the uh, existing intersection had more impacts to the Black Crown Marsh. The proposed improvements at Fisher Road is a single lane roundabout with the intersection shifted slightly south and east. This minimizes impacts to the Black Crown Marsh. And before I pass it over to Ben to discuss the benefits of the roundabout, we are going to show a brief animation of the proposed improvements. I apologize ahead of time if this video appears choppy or is in poor quality at times. The video will be posted to the project website for additional viewing. We begin at the south end, looking west along Case Road. As we approach Darrow, you'll notice the realignment to the north to the intersect Darrow Road at Neville Road with a single lane roundabout. We turn north, note the shared use path on the east side of the roadway. We now shift to a street level view to give you a different perspective of the improvement. As we approach Dowell Road, you can see the realignment to intersect, Darrow, to intersect at Darrow Road closer to 90 degrees. The shared use path continues along the east side and you can see the minimal impacts to the Black Crown Marsh. Here is the Fisher Road roundabout. 
and you can see the shared use path continues along the east side and heads towards Fisher Road on the south side, where it will continue to the Grand Illinois Trail. That is the proposed improvement for the Darrow Road corridor. I hope you're able to view this video without any troubles. Again, this will be available to view on the project website. And I'll pass it over to Ben to discuss the benefits of, of roundabouts. All right, thanks, Jim. So not only will I discuss a little bit about the benefits of roundabouts, but I'm gonna start just by talking about the definition of what a modern roundabout is. So I know that there's not a lot of roundabouts in, in Lake County or in the in the area. So we wanna just give a little refresher for those that, that may uh, not drive through them regularly. First of all, a modern roundabout is a compact circular intersection in which traffic flows counterclockwise around the center island. Entering traffic yields to circulating cars. So those coming up to the up to the intersection will always yield to those within the circle. The people in the circle have the right of way and will exit uh, prior to people entering the roundabout. And the last and probably one of the most important things is that roundabouts are designed to slow the speed of vehicles. So in these rural areas like Darrow Road where speeds can be a little higher, the roundabouts will help to slow traffic down. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about yielding because yield is something that is not used a lot in, in roadways today. Um, so first of all, some people um, may think yield is similar to merge at roundabout it, and it's really not true. So I wanna speak a little bit to, to that. A yield sign means that you actually yield to the traffic within the circle. So here I've got a, on the screen, a multi-lane roundabout. You can see that the people on the, that are coming up to the roundabout, there's a camper, a, a vehicle pulling a camper and another car next to it. And as they approach the circle there, there's obviously a car right in front of them so they know to yield, but you also need to consider there, the white car on the other side may be coming around the circle. So those vehicles need to be cognizant of people coming around the circle as they come up to this and yield, yield the right away to those within the circle. Next slide, Jim. So a couple more examples here. Um, as you as you come up to it, obviously this is a case where this vehicle is is yielded at the, but there's there's no traffic to the left, and it's okay to enter the roundabout. A couple more pictures here that at that same location, the vehicle's up at the yield line. You can see that the on the left picture, there's a black vehicle there. Now there seems to be a gap there. And, and in some cases people would think, well, I can just merge in between those two vehicles. But in reality, that's not what you're supposed to do. You're not supposed to merge, you're supposed to yield. And that means wait for the gap to occur in the traffic. So as you can see on the right, they waited for the, the black vehicle to pass and then entered the roundabout. All right. All right, so for those of you that are, are maybe not familiar with roundabouts too much, there are seven existing roundabouts in Lake County and we've, we've listed them here on the screen. So I'll, I'll give you a second to look at these, but I encourage you to, to go out and, and drive some of these roundabouts. I know there's also some other roundabouts in adjacent counties or, or north in, in Wisconsin that you can that you can go visit, but I, I encourage you to, to go drive them and experience them. All right, next slide, Jim. All right, so a little bit about the benefits of roundabouts and why why are we building roundabouts? Well, first of all, we, we do build roundabouts occasionally to, to, to make that, them work better operationally, uh, but most of the reason that we build roundabouts is due to safety concerns. Um, so as, as Joel explained earlier, there's, there's a, a fairly high number of crashes at the intersections on Darrell Road. So as, as we looked at alternatives here, um, we wanted to look at the safety of the alternatives as well. And the, the figures shown on the slides here on the left, you can see a traditional intersection. All of the dots on the, on the um, figure show the potential crashes that can happen at a traditional intersection. And the red dots are those that, that are uh, more severe type crashes like right angles or what you might call a T-bone type crash. And as you can imagine with those types of crashes, the severity of, of the crash is usually greater 
um, causing injuries and even fatalities in, in people that are in those types of crashes. The roundabout on the right hand side, you can see, first of all, there's a lot less crash types that can occur at a roundabout. But secondly, the, the crashes that do occur because of the slower speeds and the angles of the crashes are, are a lot less severe. Next slide. So just to um, a lot of a lot of agencies that are putting in roundabouts are, are looking at what what are the reductions in crashes that are occurring at roundabouts. So here are three roundabouts within Lake County, Hunt Club at Milburn Road, Hunt Club Road at Wadsworth Road and Everett Road at Riverwoods Road, where they looked at uh, three years of, of data prior to the roundabout and then the three years of crash data after the roundabouts were installed. And what, what was found here was that the crashes were reduced by 46% overall, and that the injury and fatal crashes were reduced by 85%. And that's important because those, those numbers are actually very close to the numbers that are being seen nationwide. When the first, uh, when roundabouts were kind of first introduced in the United States and started to get popular, it was these kind of numbers that that people were seeing when roundabouts were put in, and that that really put an emphasis on using roundabouts to improve safety, and that's why you're seeing a lot more of them built today. Next, I'll talk a little bit about pedestrians. So as, as they mentioned in this, there will be a path next to Darrow Road and there will be crossings for pedestrians and bicycles throughout the corridor. And a lot of people ask, well, how, how does it work with pedestrians and roundabouts and are they safe? Well, first of all, one of the things I mentioned about roundabouts is they're designed to slow speeds and, and single lane roundabouts are traditionally designed to keep speeds of vehicles to 25 miles an hour or less. And as you can see on the screen here, this was provided by the Oregon Department of Transportation, but they, they once did a study and what the pedestrians chances of survival if hit by a motor vehicle. So you can, you can see that if, if you're hit by a vehicle that's moving 20 miles per hour as a pedestrian, you have an 85% chance of survival and, and that percentage drops to 15% when vehicles are traveling 40 miles per hour or greater. So you, you can you can see um, fairly quickly that the slower speeds at roundabouts are, are very good if a, if a crash does occur with a pedestrian. Um, and, and I will say too with that that it, at signalized intersections in rural areas, the speeds of the vehicles moving through them are, are are often much, much higher in the 40 to 45 mile an hour range, even, even with traffic calming um, features. So on this slide here, we'll just talk a little bit about how pedestrians cross at a roundabout. Well, first of all, so on the left-hand side, you can see if a pedestrian were trying to cross Fisher Road there, and we'll start on the left-hand side of the picture, all they have to do is look to the left to where that one red arrow, the one pointing down, all they're doing is looking at that in that one direction for traffic and then they're able to move to the center island, the splitter island, and then they can look to the right for traffic from one direction and move across the, the intersection. So the crossing is shorter than at a traditional location and you only have to look for traffic in one direction and the traffic should be moving fairly slowly as it either approaches or exits the roundabout. On the right hand side, you can see a more traditional, it's the existing intersection, but you can imagine if we did put sidewalks or paths out there, um, as you try to cross, you need to look, first of all, in three different directions for traffic. The three different arrows show the, where the traffic may be coming from and the crossing distance is longer. So a little bit more challenging to, to cross with the traditional intersection. Next slide. How about as a cyclist, a bicyclist, as you use use this? Uh, first of all, you could you could be using the multi-use uh, path on the outside, and if you were using that and you come up to the intersection, you would just cross like a, like a pedestrian. But if you were riding on the shoulder or on the road, um, you have two choices as you approach the roundabout. On the left-hand side, you can see that the cyclist just rides right through the circle. Um, most cyclists that are using rural road locations like this and riding on the shoulder are 
riding at a little higher speeds, maybe 15 to 20 miles an hour. And that, that corresponds nicely with the speed of the vehicles as they enter the roundabout. So when, when we put roundabouts in these kind of locations, cyclists will often use the road and they, they feel safe because the vehicles are not traveling a lot faster than they are. However, if they don't feel as safe, on the right-hand side, we, we will have uh, bike ramps off of the road. So you can go right from the shoulder onto the multi-use path, cross like a pedestrian would in the pedestrian locations, and then re-enter the shoulder on the other side. So you um, have options as a cyclist as you use the roundabout. With that, I'm gonna turn it back to Joel to finish up. All right, uh, so we're in the final thing here, uh, final slide. Our next steps are to prepare the final uh, project report uh, that will go to the county and then uh, get approved hopefully in the next uh, couple months or so. Uh, we'll continue with phase two engine design engineering and where the right-of-way acquisition will uh, start to occur and then we'll have construction. Um, we're looking at construction right now, um, you know, depending on how uh, the phase two goes uh, potentially in 22 or 23. Um, so it's still a few years out, but um, we're moving forward towards it. I uh, see there's some questions coming in. Uh, please submit your questions through the Q&A feature. Um, again, if your question isn't answered uh, during the meeting, it'll be answered and posted on the project website. Um, so we do have some questions that we'll uh, start to answer. Um, explain the need for retention ponds and how they're made. Okay, so um, let's see, for retention ponds or detention ponds, um, based on the calculations that we've done, um, there's an increase in hard surface area or what we call impervious area. And what we do is we calculate what uh, that is, and then we use a, a formula to determine how much detention we need. Uh, detention really is for, to control the runoff rates how fast the water that drops in our project area goes to the outlet. And so we need detention in order to uh, basically mitigate for that. Um, I'm not quite sure how they're made. Um, you know, really they're just excavated um, and then there's plantings put in there. Um, I think that Lake County SMC and Lake County usually has a, uh, um, you know, uh, native planting plan for the detention ponds. Um, th that'll have to be coordinated with Lake County SMC um, as we move forward into the, the phase two design. Um, let's see, what's next? Uh, tell me how the plans looked at the number of mature high value trees, oaks and hickories would be lost due to this project. Um, so we don't have those details right now, but the tree replacement and suitable locations um, Basically, what we would do is, um, hang on a second, uh, those would be determined after we have the final impacts. Um, we would need to do a tree inventory survey. Uh, we haven't done a completed one yet. Uh, the selection of native plantings uh, to be replaced will be determined during phase two. Um, you know, that's where we really get um, you know, more into the details of exactly which tree will be taken and which ones. Um, impacts to private properties, trees, um, wetlands, uh, that'll be minimized to the extent possible as we get farther into the design. Hi, Joel, I do wanna add that as we were looking at the location of the shared use path, um, it wasn't just when it was on the west side compared to the east side, moving it to the east side did re result in fewer tree removals as well. True. Okay, um, there aren't any options to save some of these trees. It seems every option picked took the most trees down. How is that environmentally friendly? Um, that's a good question. Uh, like uh, Jim Tibble just said, um, you know, we did uh, move the bike path from the west side to the east side, um, which uh, lessened the amount of trees that were going to be taken. Um, you know, as we will go into the phase two, um, there is opportunity to refine the design 
and try to determine you know exactly which trees will be taken and which ones um, will be done. Um, you know we do try to replace them uh, as we can throughout the, the corridor and some other areas as you know I don't know exactly what that uh, replacement um, you know number is but that'll be determined um, from there. And some of these trees, Joel, are also located within the right of way and uh, somewhat closer to the roadway. And we, we've seen from the crash history that there are uh, fixed object crashes or single car crashes where they run off the road and they are hitting the trees as well. Yes. Um, let's see, there's questions coming in. That's good. Um, what are the target dates? Oh, sorry, I missed one. Thank you for an excellent presentation and more importantly for a carefully designed and well-considered project. Well, we all thank you for that as well. Um, as an avid cyclist who often uses Daryl Road, I especially appreciate the consideration of the given to cyclists. I support the project. Thank you very much. Um, what are the target dates for the to finalize uh, the design report, obtain report, appro report approval, right-of-way acquisition, and what is the process of acquisition? Um, so to finalize the design report, um, we're looking at uh, probably a, a good couple months here to finalize that. Um, then obtain report approval. I think that would be another month or so. So we're looking at probably sometime in the summer. Um, right away acquisition. Um, what's the process of the acquisition? So, you know, as we go forward um, with the phase two engineering, um, what will happen is that the phase two will look at the, the design. Um, they'll finalize what the right-of-way takes will be, and then they'll start the appraisals, uh, which will, um, from the appraisal process, that's when they'll reach out to each of the property owners and start that process. So um, as far as a schedule goes, I don't really have a schedule as far as that, uh, that process, but um, I would expect that sometime, you know, maybe Matt knows more about that um, as far as the schedule for the phase two uh, to get the right away, right away going, but I would expect you know maybe sometime in the fall, um, appraisals will take place. Yeah, I can jump in here, Joel. Okay. With the with the right away, yeah. The, um, you know we we're we're still kind of finalizing exactly what the right away needs are. Um, I see Bob's uh, Bob's question on there. I have to, um, I know I've chatted with Bob a few times about this as well, but um, you know we're hoping to have our right away finalized in the next couple months here. Um, and then like Joel said, we'll start the appraisal process and then hopefully around probably like on the fall, maybe um, maybe early fall, we will be ready to make some offers on properties. So. All right. Um, I'm very excited for this bike path. How far south will the bike path go on Daryl Road? Um, Jim, do you want to bring up the overall uh, plan? And maybe we can just kind of kind of show where where it's going to end. Uh, visual sometimes is better. Um, there we go. So right now, um, the path is going to uh, tip. Yeah, Jim, why don't you just jump in? Yeah. Uh, so the path is starting <clears throat> basically uh, beginning at the Case and Neville Road intersection. Um, all four legs of that intersection will have the uh, bike ramps um, and, and pedestrian crossings, as Ben kind of discussed earlier. And the path will begin at that intersection and continue north. And then at the north end, scroll up. At the north end, the path will continue to Fisher Road and then along the south side of Fisher, uh, just uh, just within the project limits, and then it will end, and that it will end and connect to the future Grand Illinois Trail. Okay. Um, we bought our property in 1980. Survey states we own to the center line of Darrell Road. Will taxes be lowered? Uh, we will have animals and barns close to the road. Not a fan of the bike path. Will we be paid for our use of the land? Um, so 
uh, survey states that we own to the center line of Darrow Road. Yeah, that, that'll be part of the kind of the plats part of the right of way acquisition. Um, will taxes be lowered? Um, I am I'm not a, that is not outside the realm of what I can, I can say as far as taxes being lowered. I, I'm not sure about that. Um, if anybody from the county maybe has an answer for that, but I, I think that's something that I'm not sure what, what would happen. Um, as far as there's another couple of questions here, will we be paid for the use of our land? Yes, um, that is part of the right of way acquisition process that will be starting um, in the next few months. Um, that was uh, we talked about earlier. Um, you know, we'll start the appraisal process, uh, and then that's when people, uh, someone will reach out and start the start that process. So, um, when is the proposed? When is the proposed to begin and how long will each phase take to complete? Um, I am not sure what, what you mean by when is the proposed to begin. So I think you mean construction. Um, if you're talking about construction, um, you know, that'll be, there'll be a staging plan part as done as part of the phase two engineering. Um, so that, that'll be worked out in phase two, but let's say that you know, the project begins, we're, we're looking at potentially in 2022, depending on if we can get the right of way acquisition in place. Um, it will be a, probably a full construction season. So if construction starts in March, it'll go through, um, you know, throughout the, that year. If it starts in 23, then it would be, you know, likely a full year. Um, it's still, we're still not sure if we're going to be doing all three at the same time or whether we do one and then some you know, one year and then maybe the two northern ones another year, that's still going to be worked out in phase two. Um, next question is, will the shared use path be paved? Uh, yes, it'll be paved. Um, I missed the earlier meetings. Is the proposed budget discussion in those? So um, I did write down um, what, what the costs that we have currently programmed. Um, currently for the case and Neville, um, cost for the, the proposed improvement is about $5.3 million. And then for both Dow and Fisher, it's about $7.3 million. So all in told, um, you know, over $12 million for the, for the improvements, including, um, you know, the in-between, uh, the resurfacing, you know, the, as part of the phase two, that will be tightened up, that cost will be tightened up, and we'll have a better idea later, but that's what we have right now. Um, for number 11, is there a difference in the width of the paved shoulder between the preferred alternative and the existing shoulder? Um, Jim, Tibble, you want to take that one? Yeah, I can jump in. Um, so right now, the, the existing paved shoulder is, um, there's not much of it. There's maybe one to two feet of paved shoulder. Um, and the Darrow Road will be upgraded to the county standard, which is having four feet of paved shoulder. Uh, and then four feet of aggregate shoulder as well. Okay, uh, next. Um, knowing Lake County's circular economy initiatives and the water retention soil health benefits of utilizing finished compost as a soil amendment, might this project be planning to spec purchase any compost made from recycled organic material? Um, I am not sure um, about that. Um, anybody from the county want to jump in on that one? Sure, Joel, I can jump in. Um, we have used, um, you know, soil additives and things like that on other projects. Uh, most recently, our Peterson Road project, uh, we did some infiltration ditches along the project and um, spec, I don't remember if it was mushroom compost or, or something similar uh, like that. So we do take a look at all that stuff during the phase two design and wherever there's opportunities to use recycled material, we, we certainly do, um, especially with, um, you know, a lot of those provide water quality and retention benefits and stuff like that. So we will look at that, um, you know, the whole package there as part of the phase two design and, and give consideration to those. All right, thanks, Kevin. Um, so the next question, I uh, just want to remind you that the oak tree provides an amazing way to sequester lots of carbon, an important consideration these days. Well, that, thank you for that uh, comment. We'll take that into consideration as we uh, uh, move forward with the, the, 
inventorying the trees and, and moving forward with a specific or the detailed design. Um, has any consideration been given to the amount of truck traffic turning onto Case Road from McGinty Brothers? The real, realignment of Case Road would seem to present a concern for sight lines of the trucks entering and leaving the roadway. Um, yes, uh, Jim, uh, do you want to take that as well? Um, I believe that we did look at um, sight distance from that driveway onto Case. Yeah, I believe we did. and. Um... There's adequate sight distance uh, at that intersection or at that driveway. And we also ran some, uh, some turning templates, uh, modeling the trucks turning into and out of the driveway. And, um, you know, they, they can, they will be able to make the turns now. Um, the turns that they make now, they will be able to make uh, with this improvement. Just wanted to jump in here too. I see, um... You know, from from Brian uh, Wilson, I can see from McGinty. I know we he had sent a comment about that uh, before, and you know I did make a mention to the Phase Two team to take a look at the site distance and possibly including some brush trimming and things like that. Um, we noticed when you're looking kind of east uh, out of the McGinty driveway, there's some uh, brush and trees and things like that. So we can definitely include some of that, um, you know, tree trimming and things like that in that in that area to kind of help uh, help with that site distance for you know, trucks turning out of there um, to see cars, you know, westbound traffic on case there, so. Okay, um, the next question is, what are the expected dates of Darrow Road to be shut down? Uh, and will the road be open to school buses to pass through during construction? Um, you know, that really is still up for uh, analysis on how this is gonna be staged. Um, it just depends on, uh, there's a lot of different factors uh, that'll, that'll happen. Um, coordination will occur, um, whatever the staging is that happened, that is decided in phase two, um, you know, that coordination will occur with school districts and some of the communities to make sure that we have an idea of, of who's using it and when, uh, so that we can minimize disruption. Um, what's next? Will the county Let me just jump in, Joel, real quick. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Matt. Yeah, with, with, with the staging of it, you know, we understand that, you know, we, that we're going to be maintaining, we need to maintain access to a lot of these properties um, at, you know, at the same time. We're not trying, we don't want to be, you know, cutting off access to people's properties by, you know, um, having two roundabouts under construction at once and kind of isolating the middle of the, of, um, you know, of the corridor there so people can we, we want to maintain access to all their properties. And so people should be able to get to them. Um, you might have to take a, a detour or come in from the north or possibly come in from the south, but we're still working out those details and exactly how the staging is going to work as Joel mentioned, um, depending on you know how the right of way acquisition goes. We may start the case Neville one first, or we might start the two up north, just kind of depends on um, how the right of way uh, shakes out here, so. Uh, next question is, will the county pay moving expenses for renters who may be displaced by acquisition? Um, you know, I think I know the answer, but I'd, I'd rather have someone from the county kind of ch chime in here uh, to make sure. Either Matt or maybe Kevin. Yeah, um, you know, typically uh, for renters who are displaced, displaced um we'll follow we're, we're going to be following um there's a process there's a basically um, you know right away acquisition process that we'll be following and i'd have to check and exactly see what um what those you know what those rules state and things like that but um that will be worked out um with the homeowner i'm assuming this is for the full acquisition uh parcel and we will be coordinating with the property owner um on that and we are aware that there are renters uh in the in the uh in the building there that he uh in his home there so we will be coordinating that through the land acquisition process and there is um there are rules to that that we have to follow as well so we'll be following those accordingly yeah and this is kind of a follow-up to that matt uh, with a property that is being rented how do i determine when they must vacate and when the county takes possession um, they obviously need time to relocate as well as the property owner obviously moving in winter is not the most desirable so uh, you know, to me, that's just uh, uh, coordinating with the county um, on 
you know, that process of, of appraisals and negotiations, you know, having that open communication with them and, and seeing, you know, how, how quickly that that can be done and maybe talking about a timeline to do that. So, um, let's see what is next. Um, is the budget coming from state and local taxes and that are there additional taxes being implemented for this project? So, um, so as far as how this project is being paid for, um, there's a, you know, there's a couple different potential funding sources. One is uh, potentially rebuild Illinois, um, which is part of, you know, I, it's kind of hard to explain, but it is part of the, the money that the county would be getting um, as, you know, from the state. Um, as far as additional taxes um, being implemented for this project, uh, you know, I'll let the county take that, but I, no additional taxes are being levied as part of this project, like a special assessment or something like that. So, Kevin, go ahead. Yeah, Joel, I mean, that's pretty much it. You hit it on the head is that um, it is state and local taxes for this project. So the rebuild Illinois um, capital bill that came out a couple of years ago um, has bond money that was um, divvied up to local agencies, counties and municipalities and such. So we're making this project eligible for that. Um, so we could use some of those funds as well as um, local funds that are um, that are um, you know, part of our, our standard revenues and stuff like that through the county. So it will be funded with state and local taxes. Um, we did submit a couple times for federal funding on this project and uh, we're unsuccessful with, with getting some of those funding grants. So we were trying to get federal funds for the project and, uh, and just didn't shake out. So we will be funding it with local funds. Right, I'm going to take over the questions now. It looks like <clears throat> next question. Uh, sorry, I'm catching up on the questions here. Okay, with with property purchases, will the value of the privacy provided by the trees removed be compensated as well? I will. I will uh, pass that over to Kevin or Matt. Thanks, Jim. Um, yes, uh, John, um, trees, you know, screening and things like that, those are all taken into account in the in the appraisal that would happen. Um, so a loss of screening is, is something that is typically seen on some of these appraisals and things like that. Um, you know, tree, trees removal, if tree removal on, I'll say your property had to occur, you would be compensated for that. Um, tree removal in the existing right away, um, that's on the county's property. Um, there would be no compensation for those trees, but uh, anything I, that would be on, I'd say your property that we buy would be, and um, you know, a loss of screening is something typically that we've seen on um, similar appraisals and things like that, so. Okay. Not a fan of the oversized bike lanes. Why was the south end of Darrell Road refurbished okay with shoulder pads, yet north end refurb needs better bike roads than most towns have. Um, just to kind of summarize the, the proposed improvement, the, uh, the four foot shoulder that's paved is a Lake County standard that they uh, implement on all their roadways. <clears throat> and that is adjacent to uh, the four foot aggregate shoulder. The 10, use, the 10 foot shared use path that's gonna be on the east side of the roadway, that is for pedestrians and bicyclists and it allows um, multi-use for it. Um, and this, this segment of the roadway is along the, the 2040 non-motorized plan for uh, bike, way, bike accommodations as well, um, which is why that is being implemented. And that is the last of questions I see. If uh, there are any other questions, please, uh, please let us know. We'll, uh, we won't let the uncomfortable silence go too long, but, uh, um, you know, we'll, we'll stick around a little bit here just to see if there's any other uh, comments, maybe a couple more minutes. And as, if they don't, if there isn't, um, then what we'll do is 
uh, close the meeting. And again, uh, comments can't, we'll take comments anytime. If you wanna, you know, you think of something later, you know, you can always come back, um, you know, go to the website and uh, um, make some comments or questions, you know, if you have them through there. So uh, Matt, go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna say throw that uh, throw that slide back up there for the for the Q and A and things like that. So everyone's got the the project website, and um, you know feel free to submit your questions through there. There should be an online um, kind of a Q and A tool that's gonna be on there that'll um, submit your question and will come right to my inbox. So I'll take a look at those and we'll be responding accordingly. I'll give everybody maybe another minute, um, and then uh, uh, we'll we'll shut shut down the meeting. Yeah, I just checked our website, Joel. Just uh, we don't have that Q and A submittal form up yet, but um, it'll be up there tomorrow. I'll make sure that it uh, that we get it up there. So if your question wasn't answered or you felt a little uncomfortable asking it in the public setting, feel free to submit it um, through the website. You have a couple more questions that popped up. So Joel, maybe you can go through those, but one of them was to replay the ground visual. So maybe as we're kind of talking or going through these questions, I don't know if um, Tibbs can maybe cue that up and play the, the drive-by again. There you go. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's that sounds good. So there's a couple more here. Um, let me read these. Um, the bike pass. Oh, uh, very good presentation. Thank you. I think all these meetings should be online now. Uh, that's a that's a some good feedback because you know um, I think some people like to get out and some people it's just easier with their schedules to to pop on for a little bit and and catch some of this. So thank you for that. Uh, the bike pass seemed to end. Uh, seem the back bike pass seemed to end. Will the master bike path be done with this project? Um, so I think. Uh, the master bike path. Uh, so what's going to be done with this project is what you're seeing now on the east side of Darrell Road. Um, there is the Grand Illinois Trail, which may be what you're talking about, which comes from McHenry County. Um, we're still coordinating with IDNR on the timing of that, um, when that's going to go. Um, we're not sure, but, um, you know, we have to kind of start somewhere as far as, uh, you know, implementing some of these bike, uh, initi not initiatives, but bike plans and, and and some of those things. So um, that part of it, the Grand Illinois Trail, that will not be part of this project, but um, we are coordinating that uh, potential implementation with this project. Um, the property on Fisher Road will be harder to access due to the increased traffic. Are there any safety considerations being made? Um, so if we could, yeah, I'll. Uh, as far as Fisher Road. So really, um, you know, as part of this project, um, what we're trying to do, so if we're looking at traffic, traffic existing and then traffic in the year 2040, that traffic is going to be there in 2040, whether these improvements are done or not. Now we can say that potentially, you know, if we're making it better, that there might be more traffic. But what we're trying to do with the increase in traffic in the year 2040 is to make it safer. Um, so there is going to be traffic, um, but uh, with the roundabouts, um, you will have access off of Fisher. I, I, I think there's going to be enough gaps based on what the ADT shows in order to get out of your driveway. I think that's probably what you're what you're talking about. So um, could we play the ground visual? Yeah, we can we can play that another time if you want. Um, are there any proposals for similar roundabouts? off Gilmer Road by Callahan and Fish Lake Road. Um, I am going to pass that to one, somebody from the county, um, see if there's anything uh, roundabouts off Gilmer by Callahan and Fish Lake Road. Uh, yeah, we don't have anything at those locations um, currently planned or programmed at this time, um, but every year uh, annually, we do take a look at system wide and we do, rank uh, projects that are, you know, identified in our long range plan or ones that come up out of, you know, meetings like this and public inquiries and stuff like that. So we will um, keep that in the records and we'll pass that along to our traffic team and take a look at, um, you know, crashes and things like that out there um, and give it consideration for future programs. So thank you for that. Uh, thank you for that uh, bit of information. 
Um, is there an acceptable loss factor being taken into account by having three roundabouts so close with people not accustomed to them in general? Um, we haven't really heard from uh, Ben. Maybe Ben can can take this one. Um, I don't know if you can see the question, but I'll read it. Sure. Again. Yeah, no, I, I can see it and I, I, I understand it. But I, I would say uh, no. In, in, in general, I mean, we when we build these, people are going to, they'll, they'll be good signing those kind of things um, on the roundabouts. They're not really closely spaced. We, we have seen locations where we put roundabouts really close together and there's a little bit of a factor when that, when that occurs, but these ones are far enough apart that they will act kind of independently of each other. And uh, people will learn very quickly that are driving this corridor, what they are, how to drive them. And, and single lanes are, are just in general um, easier. Uh, if you've driven around and driven multi-lane roundabouts, there's a, there's a much bigger learning curve on those. Um, but we, we just have not seen, um, having put lots and lots of these in place and, and in places with them closer together, uh, there's there's usually not a loss a loss factor that would be needed for this. Okay, thanks, Ben. Um, next question: um, We have a busy business and it's difficult to turn west. Uh, I think this was probably part of the Fisher uh, comment due to the curve and the hill, which restrict visibility. So, yeah, we'll look into that. Um, and, and get back to you and, and kind of look at that in a little bit more detail to look at see how how the site distance and, and that traffic um, could affect your your business. Um, will Daryl Road improvements be, be continued north to 120? So for this project, um, no, it won't be continued north to 120. Um, I don't know if there's anything you know in in the Lake County plan to go farther north up to 120 or if there's any, any other plans up at up at 120, but um, no, at this time, that's that's uh, that's not part of this project. Um, are the bike paths intended to move weekend bike clubs off the roadways, and will signs be posted to get the cyclists off the road and out of traffic? So um, they're not intended to move weekend bike clubs necessarily off the roadways. Um, what it um, does is uh, gets more people that are not comfortable riding on the roadway uh, to be off the roadway and be able to to bike, you know, up and down Darrell Road and get to some some destinations as those connections start to come up. Um, will signs be posted to get the cyclists off the road and out of traffic? So, you know, the the four foot shoulder that's part of Lake County's uh, cross sec typical cross section really helps with uh, you know maybe a little bit wider than there is out there right now. Um, you know, there's a, we'll make it a little bit safer for bicyclists to go up and down and maybe you can see them better. Um, so, um, you know, it's not really intended to get them off the roadway, but, uh, I think the improvements that we're doing will help create a safer experience, whether you want to be on the roadway or when you want to be off the roadway. Um, what does the bike trail on case road connect to is route 12 plan to have a bike route. Um, the bike path on Case Road. Case Road. I don't know that there is one on. Oh, I see what you're saying. So at this point, um, so they're really looking at the design. Thanks, thanks, uh, Jim. So basically, the you kind of maybe zoom in. There isn't a bike trail on Case Road. Um, it does, as Jim mentioned earlier, it is. Uh, you know, does end at Daryl Road. Um, you know trying to make these connections, you know, there is a, uh, I believe bike lanes on Bonner Road to the south, you know, at some point, you know, we have to move forward with some of these connect, you know, start the, the connection somewhere um, to, to implement some of these things, you know, um, so it, it doesn't go anywhere at this point, but um, with the planned Grand Illinois Trail, you know, that's a really key connection as far as the overall bike network and bike plan within the county and adjacent counties as well. So um, Kevin, go ahead. Yeah, I can jump in there too. I think that's a good point. I mean, uh, I'm not aware of anything on Case Road or anything along 12, uh, at least as part of our kind of long range plan. Um, I think another thing here, if you can zoom in maybe 
uh, Jim, a little bit more is that we do um, provide the bike pass around the roundabouts as well as a way to um, accommodate the on-road cyclists. So there may be on-road cyclists that use Case Road. They are allowed to navigate the roundabout just like a car would, but um, some of the users prefer to get out of the roundabout. So they'll jump off that little segment of path get uh, navigate around the roundabout and then get back onto say the roadway, maybe on, on Darrow road or in case further to the West. So I think when you see those little bike path kind of stubs going East down, um, down case a little bit, that's the intention of those there. Uh, that's part of our, our Lake County DOT standard, but uh, I'm not aware of anything uh, continuing on further down case or over to 12 um, as part of any long range plans. Uh, we still got a couple more comments. Uh, please keep them coming. Um, how does blinker signaling work in a roundabout? Is your blinker required? Go ahead, Ben. All right, I'll take that one too. So um, good question. And uh, I wish I had a, a really good answer for you um, because, and the reason that I don't is because opinions vary all over the country um, on this, on this uh, question. Um, there are really no requirements to use your blinker in a roundabout. Um, some some agencies have have put out there that they prefer that nobody uses any kind of blinkers in a roundabout, and the reason being that um, some people like to signal a left turn and and some people like to signal a right turn differently at roundabouts, and there's no real good. Um, answer and, and it can be confusing for those that are using the roundabout. If if nobody uses blinkers at all, um, that keeps the drivers that are waiting or looking at the other vehicles guessing a little bit, which is which is um, probably the preferred at, at this point. Um, now, if we just to just to take you outside of the United States a little bit, in countries such as Australia, they do use. Um, blinkers and just to exit the roundabout. So when you're going to exit the roundabout, you'd put on your right hand blinker to exit. And some places in the United States are taking, trying to take that stance. Um, Carmel, Indiana, for instance, a city that has a hundred and some roundabouts to your east, um, they they do. I believe they they even have a city statute that requires using the blinker to uh, when you exit the roundabout. So just turning on the right blinker when you're going to go out of the roundabout. That would be the only time you use it, no other time. Um, but there are no requirements on it. I would say you would either not use it at all or use it just to exit the roundabout. Yeah, Ben, I traveling, you know, on my daily commute, uh, I, I see that and I travel through a couple roundabouts and I always put my blinker on when I'm exiting, but um, it's kind of like when you're going up to a right turn lane and you see some people have their blinker on at a conventional intersection right. and some don't. So I kind of equate it to that, that some people do it and some people don't. I, I do it, but maybe that's because we're transportation roadway engineers and we yeah. see the crashes that happen and things like that. But, um, you know, I, I put it on, but, uh, you know, it, it doesn't, I see a lot of people that don't as well. Right. And I think, uh, so I've done a lot of sitting at roundabouts, watching people's behaviors and trying to understand what, what they do and how they hesitate and what, what they, what they do when they're out there. And, and what we, what we generally find is, is when people don't have their blinkers on, it does make people be a little bit more hesitant on what they're going to do because they're not sure of what that other vehicle doing. And, 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 you know, that's probably the safer way of doing it. Um, but however, um, like, like Joel said, it's perfectly acceptable to, to use your right blinker when you're exiting the roundabout. And, and if you're going to do it, that would be the time. Hopefully, hopefully at some point in the, in the near future, now that roundabouts have, have really been popular in the United States in the last 20 years, we will get some, some kind of regular, uh, rules of, of that piece of it, because that it's very varying um across the country right now um what is the target for construction of the daryl road uh interchange i understand neville case will be first um that's that's in the plan right now is that neville and case will be first um you know it really depends on the right-of-way acquisition uh like i think uh you know matt said and some others said here um you know the the target for 
um, you know, is to, to build Neville and Case in 2022 and the other two in 23, but um, it really is going to be dictated by when we can uh, attain the right of way to, to be cleared for construction. Yeah, I was just going to jump in and say the same thing, Joel. Um, you know, it's just going to be dependent on how the right of way, um, you know, is, is progressing. Um, you know, if we have the two north roundabouts kind of ready first, or they are trending, looks like it might go first. You know, we might do that project first and then do the case level one second. It just is going to just going to depend on how the how the right of way uh, acquisition um, shakes out, basically. So. Um, since the bike path is on the east side of Darrow for this project, will that continue to be on the east side down past 176 to Roberts? Um, that's going to be a really a case by case basis. Um, you know, it, it depends on, you know, when there is an improvement and what factors play into it. You know, it just, it may be better to have it on the west side, south of the project area. It may be better to have it on the east side, you know, without diving into the details, we, we have no real way of knowing what that is. Um, you know, it, it is planned in the 2040 non-motorized plan for the county to, to go past, south past 176. Um, that's that's the extent that we know at this time. Um, so the next one, uh, Dow Road Roundabout from the south on Darrow will be in a blind area from cars and motorcycles, cap capping the hill that do speed northbound on Darrow Road. Your assumptions versus what happens every day in real life at afternoon rush hour will possibly make the Dow Road Roundabout a problem. Uh, ben. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, go ahead. So, I'll I'll start and just say that I mean, yes, of course, whenever we design a, a roadway there and, and we're changing things, there are things that can come up. So, you're you're right about that, but we 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 take a lot of precautions as we design these things to we're we're looking at the vertical curves. We you know, so the sight distance to the intersections, we, we look at signing and and different things signing and lighting are other things that we use to make the drivers aware of what's coming up so there are there are lots of precautions that get put in place for those kind of things um if if the roundabout was a was a traditional intersection at that same place it might make uh for instance the people trying to turn off of dowel they may be in a in a bad position in that situation too so the slower speeds of the roundabout do do help in those cases um but we will look at all of those things as we get into the final design more on on the profiles of the road making sure there's good sight distance making sure there's good signing as you come up to it um, but yes we we understand that we do look at these things Okay, thanks, Ben. Um, as a resident of the area since 1971, I just wanted to say how much I appreciate the thought and consideration that goes into a project like this. I live in Lakemore Farms, so this will have a huge impact on my daily travel. Good job to all involved. Well, thank you very much on that. Um, we have another question. Uh, will the lighting be as bright as the River Roberts roundabout? Um, it's it's going to be lit. Uh, there will be lighting at the roundabouts. Um, whether it's as bright, um, usually that they're lit about the same way. It just depends upon um, you know a lot of factors as we get into the lighting design and as part of the phase two, we'll look at a lot of different different factors. But um, I'm not familiar with um, the River Roberts and as far as the lighting goes, I don't know if anybody from the county here is, but um, it there will be a, a lighting at the roundabouts. Yeah, I'll jump in, Joel. Uh, you know, there are there is a standard um, that Illinois Department of Transportation puts out for the lighting. We will be following the, the lighting standards um, that they set forth for these types of improvements. Basically, um, there are instances where we can have like a shield on one side of the light. We have put those up on several of our roundabouts to um, do our best to kind of shield some of the light away from the adjacent properties. So um, we understand the the sensitive nature of, of of lights out here in a traditionally you know a rural area. Um, so Hunt Club and um, Milburn and Hunt Club and Wadsworth. That's kind of another example of you know where we 
work with Old Mill Creek on on the lighting there and stuff. And that's another kind of similar kind of rural area where we um, implement some of those lighting standards and some of those shields um, on the on the residential side. So we'll look at it. We'll look we'll look to do that as well. And Matt, if I can jump in with one more thing too, is we've um, we'll implement LED lighting on these too. And I'm not a lighting um, expert or anything by by any means, but I. I do know that LED lights are a lot more controllable and things like that too, um, with um, you know spillover outside the right of way and on the properties and stuff too. So in addition to what Matt said with the shielding and all that stuff, that's you know the um, how the lighting looks and everything with the LED and, and trying to minimize impacts to the adjacent properties will definitely be considered as we move forward. Well, I'm not seeing any other questions. Uh, if there's anything else, you know, we'll give a, another minute or so. Um, and then, uh, you know, we'll wrap it up. So we've had a think if this is it, you know, thank you very much for everybody for coming tonight, uh, taking time out of your night to, to listen to us. Um, you know, again, uh, there, as Matt said, there will be a a form online at the maybe Tibbs, uh, we can go back to that uh, that slide um, and show where the the comments will be, where you'll be able to to make comments um, about the meeting, so and about the project. So um, we'll give it another minute or so, and we'll uh, wrap it up. Uh, there's a few more comments that came in. Um, will the design have a landscape berm to replace existing privacy? Um, based on the cross sections, uh, you know, we'll have to look into that in a little bit more detail when we get into the phase two, but uh, the landscape or a berm, um, there won't be enough room for a berm uh, necessarily unless we're going to grade farther into uh, private properties, but um, there will be opportunities to um, plant either additional trees or something like that to work with, you know, depending on what was taken, you know, if we're taking a line of trees, there are some trees that provide some privacy if there's, you know, we try to replace those as, as best we can. Um, will easements be required to accommodate the four feet plus the aggregate? So I think what you're talking about, uh, um, the section between the two roundabouts at uh, um, Neville and Case and then Dowell. Um, there won't be any uh, easements to accommodate that part of it. Um, I believe there's going to be some easements needed for the bike path in certain sections between Case Neville and Dowell. Um, that's mostly on the, the east side. Um, there is a um, some drainage features that we may need some easements on the west side, but um, I believe in the area, you know, north, um, maybe where there's a culvert, uh, we need a, a few easements there, but generally on the west side, you know, we won't need a lot of easements. Um, yeah, and I can expand on that to uh, just in general with right away in the, in the easements and stuff like that is that, um, you know, anywhere we're working outside of our uh, right away, uh, we will be required to either get additional right away, um, or if it's just grading or temporary impacts, um, it may be a temporary easement, um, or if it's to maintain some of the culverts, it might be a permanent easement um, as opposed to actually ob obtaining the right away. But anywhere we are working outside of our right away, it'll be uh, one of those three, um, you know. Um, I guess land takes or whatever will be will be necessary. So there wouldn't be an instance where we're working on somebody's property without uh, without acquiring the proper um, the proper documentation and the proper land to do so. So just in general, I don't know if that was kind of um, you know 
I don't know yours is kind of a targeted question, uh, Tim, but just in general, so everyone understands that. Um, I think well, this will be the last uh, question for tonight uh, that we'll answer. Um, will the people with affected property get advanced notices of info or just have to wait for the next set of signs on road to let us know what is going on? Um, never got email for this meeting. So um, as far as uh, you know, waiting for the next set of signs on road to let us know, no, um, the website and um, you know, if there is any property acquisition, people will be uh, connecting you to that. Um, you know, as far as advance notice, um, I, I don't know what's going to happen in the phase two, if there will be any, you know, any meetings or anything like that. Um, but um, there will be some updates on the website that we can, and you can always reach out to the county to see where things are at if you're curious, you know, Matt or, or Kevin are happy to, you know, go over the project status if you're wondering. Um, to, to know what's going on. Um, you know, the, like I said, the website will be updated. Um, sorry that you did not get an email for the meeting. Um, you know, letters were sent out um, at least a couple weeks ago. And, um, you know, we'll, not sure. I, I know that you guys were on there, so I'm not sure if it just didn't get to you guys or not, but um, we appreciate you guys being here for this, so. All right, guys, everybody, thank you. I, we all appreciate your attendance um, to the Daryl uh, final public meeting here. As Joel kind of alluded to, you know, I'm always available um, via email. Um, you, can, you can give me a call on my um, work line if you'd like to discuss the project. I know that um, Nancy and Jean and some of these, I see a lot of these, Mr. Traeger, Mr. John Schaap, I, you know, you guys have I've spoken to you guys many times and I appreciate the feedback and, um, you know, always look to respond to you guys in a, in a timely manner and things like that. So I'm always available. Um, I'll be sticking with the project all through phase two and as well as, um, you know, into construction and things like that too. So um, feel free to reach out to me if there's any other questions um, and I'll be happy to answer those for you. But um, thank you all for attending and look, to, look forward to the project getting moving here. Thank you.